Hey everyone, it's TJ with Avidine again. In the following brief video, we're going to be discussing the IFD interface with the AXP322 remote transponder. As always, everything in the following video is for reference use only. For FA approved data, please refer to the IFD installation manual. Make sure you've got the latest revision. So we're going to jump on in uh, to the interface between the AXP322 remote transponder and the Avidine IFDs. Uh, first things first, uh, RS-232 in and out protocols are going to be set for AXP322 in and out on the IFD. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice we've got some additional wiring here for external standby, which is optional. Um, external ident, which is optional as well, and suppression I.O. So this suppression I.O. line is pin 18 on the 25 pin connector is going to be what you're going to use to connect uh, the suppression bus for like an active traffic system, something like that. Aircraft power, and pay special attention to this. Um, this power on ground basically tells the AXP322 to go ahead and turn itself on as soon as it sees power coming from this 3 amp breaker on the aircraft power in. So if you've got an AXP322 that doesn't seem to be responding to anything, double check that pin. Um, it, there does have to be a ground right there on pin 3. Now, it should also be noted that the AXP322 does not have its own connection for altitude input. That altitude input is going to be coming via the IFD on that RS-232. So, uh, got to pay special attention at least to, to make sure that the IFD is receiving pressure altitude, certified pressure altitude, from some source. So, here's the list of, of sources the IFD can take. Uh, and the priority behind it in case you've got more than one altitude source. This is what the way the IFD is going to prioritize those. So airing 429, ADC, or EFIS is going to be the highest priority all the way down to, you know, gray code input if that's all you've got. And next we've got our weight on wheels discrete. So the AXP322, it's always recommended to use the uh, pseudo weight on wheels out of the IFD. What that will do is that's going to transition um, your squat switch input on the AXP322 at around 35 knots GPS ground speed. Um, and, and the idea behind that is because there's two pieces that have to transition. There is your regular uh, mode S, mode A, mode C stuff that's going to transition from standby to altitude or from ground to altitude mode and then there's also the ADSB portion of the data that has to transition as well from ground to air so it's best to just use the IFD pseudo weight on wheels output that way those transitions happen at the same time and this drawing is showing the addition of a four pole two throw switch um, or relay, and the, the point here is if you've got a single IFD and you're driving uh, dual transponders from a single IFD, you're going to need to add this. Um, these top two poles, you can see, are just swapping in uh, our RS-232 inputs uh, and outputs from the IFD. This third pole is your pseudo weight on wheels discrete coming from the IFD. And this fourth one, and this one's important, is your external standby. So one side's going to be tied to ground, the other side's going to be tied to the external standby. Now if you notice that in the drawing here, we're showing this in the normally closed position. So right now, everything from the IFD is driving the number one transponder but the wiring on the external standby is swapped. So what we've got going on here is we've got the number two that we're driving into standby while the number one is active. So make sure you don't get those confused on that uh, fourth leg 
of this. That's uh, something to pay attention to at least. Okay. Again, this is only recommended if you're doing a single IFD to dual transponders. If you've got dual IFDs, it's highly recommended to wire them independently. Uh, you know, AXP322 number one to IFD number one, AXP322 number two to IFD number two. You will still need to wire in a switch for that external standby, um, but it, it adds another level of redundancy if you can do independent wiring to each IFD. Next, we're going to jump into the configuration settings. So, um, again, on our main RS-232 config page, uh, we're going to set that for AXP322 in and out. And the rest of the configurations that are specific to the transponder are going to take place on the remote transponder config page. So, um, something to keep in mind here. When you set the RS-232 uh, in and out to AXP322, you will likely need to do a power cycle on the IFD so that it comes to life and understands that there's supposed to be an AXP322 there before this remote transponder configuration page will pop up. Um, and it'll be in your config pages, so you'll have to scroll through and find it. But if it's not populating, it's probably because we just turned on that RS-232 line um, and it doesn't know yet that there's supposed to be an AXP322 there. So you might have to do a power cycle. On that remote transponder config page, um, we're going to jump into some of the details here. So up top, we've got our hex code. So this is where you're going to put your ICAO code for your tail number. Um, aircraft width, aircraft length, GPS linear offset. Now this, this receiver section for 1090 megahertz receiver or UAT receiver, this is an important one. So what this is basically doing is this is setting the transponder to tell the ground station on what frequency you're receiving ADSB information. So if you only have a UAT receiver on board, you're going to want to make sure that you set UAT receiver to yes and 1090 megahertz receiver to no or vice versa. And the reason why is because the ground station actually is listening to this data and it's determining what it needs to rebroadcast on ADSR. So in this scenario, we've got our UAT receiver set to yes, 1090 receiver set to no. What this is going to do is it's going to tell the ground station, hey, I need the ADSR or the rebroadcast for the 1090 targets because I don't have a 1090 receiver on board. So the end result of that is we're going to tell the ground station our location and tell it what frequency we're listening on. Ground station will then go, okay, you've got a UAT receiver on board, so you need the ADSR as well. So we're going to send out UAT targets, and we're also going to send the 1090 targets rebroadcast on the 978 frequency. If these settings are incorrect based off of the receiver you have on board, the end result of that is going to be very intermittent traffic. Um, and what I mean by that is sometimes it'll work fine, sometimes it won't. It just depends on what aircraft out there are broadcasting on frequency-wise, and it may also depend on what type of airspace you're in, because if someone else is telling the ground station to go ahead and send the ADSR information, you're still going to pick it up. Uh, but it's not you that's triggering that, it's someone else. Um, again, squat switch logic, um, we're going to set that for Avidyne. That's driven from the pseudo weight on wheels out of the IFD. Now, if you guys are, are doing a uh, 91411 or 413 check on this thing and you need to put it in altitude mode, <clears throat> it's pretty hard to fake a you know 35 knots GPS ground speed. So what you're going to do in that scenario is you're going to go in here and you're going to change the squat switch input to ignore. And when you do that, It'll let you reboot the IFD, and it should let you manually go into altitude mode on your transponder. The big thing to, to be careful of there is if you're just doing a 91411 or 413 check, make sure that you go back and set that back to Avidyne before you send that aircraft on its way. Otherwise, the transitions are not going to work uh, the way the pilot is expecting them to. 
Uh, next, we've got settings for aircraft class, aircraft speed, and GPS lateral offset. And then at the bottom here, we've got our certification level. So the IFD is actually certified to a level B, but the transponder itself is only certified to a level C. So we've got to set this for level C. And the bottom block here, you'll notice uh, it says hardware version, hardware option, software version, FPGA version. When these are populated, it's a pretty good indication that the transponder is communicating back to the IFD. It will tell you what hardware version it's on, what software version it's on, etc. cetera. Um, not a hard and fast rule, but generally speaking, it, it's a quick and easy way to tell that uh, you know, you're getting good communication from the transponder back to the IFD. big thing to keep in mind is after you've set everything on the remote transponder config page, you're going to need to do a hard power cycle on the whole system. Let that AXP322 come to life. Talking to the IFD, the IFD is going to tell it what its configuration settings should be. Um, if you're doing one of those uh, dual transponders driven from a single IFD, you're going to have to do this twice, do two power cycles. Um, one with it connected to the number one transponder, and then again with it connected to the number two transponder. And in both cases, give it you know up to three to five minutes apiece to allow that transponder to take in all of those configuration settings and, and wake up happy. Um, next thing is you're going to have to set up a thumbnail on the IFD for the transponder. So if you go into the um, data block settings, on the IFD. That's where you can go in and set up your data block wherever you want it or wherever the aircraft owner wants it um, to control the transponder and monitor you know your transponder code and ident and all of that. So um, the big takeaway here um, it's, it's all pretty self-explanatory once you get it programmed up but also pay careful attention because each user profile has its own specific data block setup. So if you guys are, are doing a fresh install of AXP 322s um, with an IFD, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go in and set that data block up on all five user profiles. Otherwise, what can happen is if the aircraft owner accidentally changes over to a different user profile, what it looks like to them is their transponder data block goes away. Um, and it's only because it's not set up under that user profile. So you will need to set that in multiple places. And that's pretty much it for this one. Um, I appreciate you guys watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks.